Welcome in everyone, today we have our second early access video of City Skylines 2. With our first early access video, we talked about starting a city and a lot of the basic features incorporated into City Skylines 2. And today we get the unique opportunity to go even further into the features and mechanics that this game has to offer. So if you haven't already, you should definitely check out our first early access video and be sure to hit the subscribe button because we have another video on the way. And as always, leave a like and drop a comment down below with any questions and I'll try to answer what I can, though because it is early access, I may be limited on what all I can say. And because it's early access, keep in mind that this is a work in progress and not the final release version of the game. Now we're gonna be picking up where we left off from our first video and expanding our city. So the first thing we need to do is go ahead and buy tiles in this general direction that you're going to see a large amount of our expansion take place. We're also going to be taking our downtown that we established in the first video and turning it into a much larger downtown by upgrading a lot of the zones that exist so you can see a real progression in the city growth. And you've probably noticed one of the biggest updates from the first video to the second video and that is that we have contour lines. I'm very happy to see this in the game. I know everyone was very vocal about this being a need, and here it is. We've got it. You can turn contour lines on and off depending on what you're doing, including placing roads, rails, and various other things to give you an idea of the height changes you might be dealing with with your terrain. Now, I'm going to be moving pretty quickly through this video. I'm going to go ahead and level off a lot of this and set up a couple of tiers because that's going to help me kind of move a little bit quicker through the expansion. Now, one thing that we unlocked towards the end of the last video was medium density residential. So the next thing we're going to be doing is upgrading a bunch of our row housing, especially towards the interior part of the city here, to medium density and let these areas grow out. And then I'm going to be moving our cemetery into the city. So I'm going to be removing some of our residential zoning to accommodate that. With Cities 2, you have a bunch more options in terms of the types of zones you can put down. In some ways, this gives you the option to better blend different areas together. You can go from houses to row housing to medium density and have a better fade from your residential houses all the way into your town. We're also going to be getting into adding some mixed use, which blends pretty nicely with our medium density buildings. Now, moving certain buildings around like I did the cemetery is pretty easy and straightforward. It reminds me much of Cities 1. However, there is an option to turn off snapping, which gives you a little bit more freedom on placement. This can make the experience slightly finicky, though, because if you shift it too far off the road, it may appear at angled and it's kind of hard to get it back to a straight edge. The bulldoze tool is also quite different in Cities 2. It operates on sort of a drag functionality. There are some hiccups in it where sometimes it doesn't get every building, and I don't know if that's just the sensitivity that it's at or if there's some polish that needs to go into that. But you basically start by clicking the first thing you want to delete and start hovering over other things that you want to delete. It typically works really well in lines, but then with one smooth swoop, you can delete a chunk of buildings. So there's a couple things I'm going to have to do to expand the city in the direction that I intend to, and that is start setting up infrastructure on the other side of this highway entrance. We're also going to be replacing the highway and we're going to be using a new interchange from the game to help establish how people are coming into the city. And one thing we haven't even touched on yet is signature buildings. One actually popped up right as I finished the last video, so we're going to have two to place here shortly. These are pretty cool and there's a wide variety of different buildings that fit different needs. Several of them, for example, might fit more of a residential area that helps support well-being in that area, so they do have good benefits for Sims living near them. I do like that they feel scaled properly and look pretty realistic for what they're meant to be, at least from the ones I've seen thus far. And they can be integrated into your city build pretty naturally, like that one that we just unlocked is like an apartment complex, which I'll place down here in a moment. But we just hit our next milestone, which means we get a little more cash, more expansion points, and more development points to spend on different things that we can unlock. Now I'm going to use that signature building to kind of be a cornerstone for some of our downtown area here. So I'm going to actually move our school away from this area. We're going to probably place it in some of the newer expansion areas once we get there. And I'm going to use that signature building here in downtown to be an integral part of what we're developing. Here you can start to see the medium density residential taking shape. There are some buildings that I'm not a bigger fan of. Some of those smaller ones that have little gaps between them, those aren't necessarily my favorite. I do like the bigger, bulkier buildings, especially as they start to butt up next to one another. The first signature building we're gonna place down is the Polaris Suites, the one that kind of looks like an apartment complex. This building does plus four well-being to folks living within one kilometer of the building. And my intention is to basically build the area around it with medium density residential. Providing a lot of buildings in this area will help it sort of blend in while still being unique given the paint job. I do have another signature building available, which we'll place here shortly as some of these row houses begin to take shape in this area where I'm going to actually be removing some of our low density residential housing and shifting that away from downtown. Another type of zone we didn't use in the first video that we just unlocked is offices. And offices are broken down into two types of zones, so I wouldn't assume that any of the low density offices are going to be massive skyscrapers, so you have a little more flexibility here. I'm very happy to have offices that may be two to four stories high that can be mixed in with commercial and industrial. And I think that's a very big key for cities too, to make realistic looking cities. I noticed that when placing a lot of low density commercial back to back, it didn't quite look as good as when I mixed in some offices or maybe something like row housing. You often see me mixing low density commercial and offices and bunching them together at certain avenues or along major artery roads. 
So I have a few development points to spend and we're going to focus that in on roads, specifically highways and large roads. This is going to help us with our expansion plan. It's also along the tree in order to get to interchanges. My intention is not only to change the entrance into the city from the highway, but also change the highway. So we have a lot to do. Now, I talked a lot about roads in the first video, so I don't want to rehash that, but I will say gaining more experience has helped out a lot. I've become a little bit more efficient at placing them and understanding some of the tools that exist there. Again, they are very intuitive, but I will say there are moments where some nodes don't quite smooth out the way I'd want. Hopefully, this is something that can be polished as the game gets closer to release. Two things I've really enjoyed are the ability to just overlap roads and then automatically connect, and the fact that the road tools tend to give you a preview of what you're doing. So you can kind of see the direction I want to go with expanding the city. So I'm going to go ahead and add more office space and low density commercial to this area. One thing I've been pleasantly surprised by is the diversity of buildings that you have when placing down zones. So far, I only feel like I've scratched the surface in terms of what's available from growable buildings. I'm seeing a variety of buildings for the different sizes of zone, as well as the levels to the zone. Now we have another tool to talk about that we didn't talk about in our first video, and that is creating districts. I much prefer the precision to this tool in Cities 2 over what I had in Cities 1. The sort of spray paint method of laying down that zone area in Cities 1 was never my favorite, especially because it sort of felt magnetic, but you were just kind of pushing and pulling and you could never get it quite precise, whereas this one is exactly where you want it to go. It feels very clean and simple and intuitive. And along with districts, you get a ton of information of what's going on in your district. And this is something Cities 2 seems to be really focused on, and that's giving you a ton of information about what's going on on the simulation side of your city. And of course, with districts, you also get policies that you can help control what's going on in that space. And those become unlocked as you progress through your milestones. I'm excited to see that parallel roads are something that you can do in base game Cities 2. This makes it so much easier to draw out highways where you want those side-by-side -side roads, or if you're doing something different, you wanna create sort of your own avenue, you have that option as well. It's also just as intuitive as if you were just making one road. You still get the preview of how roads are gonna merge when you're trying to connect different highways together, and you have the ability to change the spacing between the roads. I think this is gonna be a really, really helpful tool for folks that are trying to learn how to do some more complicated road design, while also making it easier for advanced players just to get the work done. I'm planning to reroute the highway here, so I'm gonna be connecting this highway to the current existing highway and placing an interchange along it for our downtown. This will give us more room to expand the city as we see fit. Now, I will admit one area that I'm still trying to understand is some of the demand along with taxes. There are times where I've seen my residential demand kind of shift very, very quickly in one direction. They may just want all low density instead of some medium density. This is sort of a balancing act. The other area that's complicated things a little bit for me is low income housing. So while we have a ton of different zone options, it can be a little bit complicated to figure out where to place them to make sure that they're as efficient as they need to be. Now we've hit our tiny town milestone, releasing more funds, expansion points and development points. We're gonna go ahead and use the development points to unlock our interchanges, which they have oddly labeled as intersection, but we'll unlock those and be able to start working on our highway changes. Now with Cities 2, you get a bunch of vanilla interchanges, which are a welcome thing for me. I'm sure many players will agree it's nice to have a bunch of these sort of in your back pocket that you can lean on when you're trying to establish a city. And much like many other parts of Cities 2, the scaling feels right. They feel more appropriate for the size and scale of your city, and I'm really happy about that across the board with Cities 2. I will say one thing I hope that gets added at some point would be the ability to actually draw a selection area out for the bulldoze tool. The only time that this is not my favorite thing is doing something like this where you're having to do multiple roads because it takes a little bit more time than just being able to cover a bigger area. So we're going to go ahead and connect our interchange into the highway system and give us that room we've been talking about adding to our city. I will say that there are some awkward instances where a parallel road tool doesn't always align the roads properly. For example, going from a two lane highway to a three lane highway, you saw that it was like a very, very abrupt turn. That's something I obviously want to avoid, but it's easily fixable by just doing that part of the road separately and letting those roads transition to the appropriate size. So I've already deleted and leveled out where the old highway was so that it gives us more room. And I'm just going to go ahead and reconnect the interchange here on the other side. I do find myself expanding pretty quickly across land in cities too. I don't know if that's all just because of scaling and how the game sort of operates, but some of the buildings just take up more room. That's largely because of zoning now taking up six blocks instead of four in terms of depth giving you the ability to expand a little bit more rapidly just in land space. But for me, this has been a welcome change. I like that buildings take up a little bit more room. I'm someone that often relied on the Steam Workshop for assets because I felt like the scaling worked better. And for this, it's been nice to see buildings take up more space. They feel more purposeful with the space that they have as well. Now, the one area that I've noticed become a little bit more finicky for me is often how zones are breaking. 
Sometimes I'm able to fix this by making some adjustments, maybe adding alleyways, but there is this instance where sometimes I don't get the full six unit depth because I have roads too close to one another. There is a way to fix this by going ahead and zoning one road and then adding the road, and then you only have six units of depth for zone on one road. Compared to Cities 1 though, I do feel like the zoning operates a little bit better when breaking the zone because it does try to keep things bundled together so you have groupings for appropriate size buildings. We've unlocked a new residential zoning type, which is mixed use. This is something that I know the community at large has been pretty excited about, and I am definitely one of those folks that is super pumped about this. This was always something that I felt like was missing from Cities 1, and it's now integrated into Cities 2 at the base game level. This is the one zone that I started placing, and I quickly realized I need to start playing with different depths of zones because there are a variety of buildings. For example, if it's only three deep, you're going to get slightly less tall buildings that are going to look more fitting for certain areas, maybe next to row housing. So you can start to create that blend from going from low to the ground buildings to higher buildings to bigger buildings. I think some of this will come in time as we become more familiar with all the zoning sizes and what buildings pop up in those. I can easily see myself relying more on alleyways in certain areas, dividing up zones a little bit differently and creating areas that are a little bit more within a block instead of these larger blocks that I've placed so far. And by placing another signature building, we're going to go ahead and boost the well-being of folks living in this downtown area. And I am, again, really excited that these signature buildings tend to fit what I'm building. They don't just feel completely obscure from what's already on the map. But one of the pleasant surprises was being able to see corner buildings pop up from some of our mixed use. And again, these aren't the same depth. They're not six deep, but I do have a corner building. And these work as a great transition from the row houses to our taller, medium density buildings. Outside of what you've seen, I've also been trying to rapidly grow the city by placing a lot of offices down, low density, commercial, and industrial. And you may notice that we're starting to run a profit, which I know some folks will be a little bit concerned about how quickly I'm generating this amount of money. But I will say this, a lot of the things that you're going to be placing in your city cost a lot of money. Hospitals and things cost a lot, and they have pretty high service fees on a month to month basis. So in some situations, in some of my testing and kind of playing and learning the mechanics of the game, I've noticed that I can actually run into a deficit if I start placing things without really considering the financial burden of them. There's a couple other services I haven't mentioned within Cities too, and one is the post office. You can place this and also place mailboxes throughout your city, which I believe makes the folks pretty happy. You can also unlock a post sorting facility with your development points later. I think being able to place the mailboxes around your city is pretty neat. It's obviously going to add some value to living there, but it's also some little neat detail that's added into the simulation side of the city and the base game. So we're going to place a few of these around the city and hopefully boost some sim happiness and continue to get XP so we can continue to level up and hit our milestones. Now, something you've seen in the dev diaries would be the radio mast. This is something else we're going to place in our city. It just feels like one more kind of unique thing that you can place in your city, something that we really haven't utilized before. Now, by looking at that tab, you can already tell that there's several other buildings that you're capable of adding down the road by hitting milestones and unlocking development points. The radio mast itself has a certain area that it's operational within, so I'm going to put it in this high density area, but then potentially need to add others as we continue to expand our city. And if you haven't been paying attention, you do get XP for placing the building and the result of Sims being happier that you place the building. So you get a little bit of a double dose of XP when you do stuff like this. Let's talk a little bit about demand. I've mentioned before that I'm still trying to understand certain densities and how they operate. Residential demand is broken up into three categories, which I think is helpful in determining what you're going to be placing in your city. I'm still learning what all is going to contribute to different demand needs or a drop off in demand. Obviously, taxes are an easy way to affect demand, but I'm looking for more of the nuanced aspects of cities, too. There's a lot of depth here and a lot of AI processing happening, but I'm sure as I dive deeper in, I'll have a better understanding of how all this operates and what all is affecting it. For example, things like wealth and education level, but there does seem to be a little more sophistication here. But sometimes what I've seen is a complete drop off of something like medium density residential and a spike in low density residential that sometimes throws me off. I'm not exactly sure what's contributing to that harsh shift in demand. Additionally, with something like low income housing, I've noticed that they often end up complaining about how high the rent is, but I can't seem to find a spot where they fit best. Now, since we've unlocked Boomtown, we also unlock policies tied to districts. Since Sims seem to love to park on the street, we're going to go ahead and add a parking fee. What I love about this is I can actually go in and customize the fee itself, something that I didn't really expect when I initially looked at it. But as you can see, by clicking the arrow, you have more options pertaining to those policies as you select them. We also need to spend our development points, so we're going to go ahead and unlock parking areas, and then I'll unlock others as we progress. But let's go ahead and see about where we can put some parking lots to accommodate downtown. This is another thing that I'm really, really happy to see in base game cities, too. It's often something I had to go venture to the workshop in order to get for a lot of my time spent in cities one. 
I can see how embedding these into different parts of downtown could add to that realism approach, especially if you're building sort of more North American themed. This is a type of asset you could fit into small spaces, maybe with alleyways, just like I did next to our radio mast, just finding opportunities to incorporate different types of buildings into your downtown area. So with all the development points we have, we need to unlock a few more things. I'm thinking we go ahead and unlock trains, so that's something that we can build here shortly, and I can give you a basic understanding of what's to expect. We're also gonna unlock the crematorium. That's another building we probably need in our city. It's really cool how the development points will really affect how you're building. In fact, I had to delay doing certain things in order to get the development points so that I could accommodate certain changes I wanted to make, like having the highways. So it's important to keep in mind what you need to be unlocking with those development points. This does play a factor in how your city develops and sort of what direction you go in. The process of leveling up isn't difficult. Getting more points, more money and stuff like that just takes time. You do have to balance certain aspects of the city build. For example, you want to make sure your Sims are happy. You'll get XP for that. You do need to be growing, so you'll get XP for that as well. So there are factors at play that may affect your ability to hit milestones very quickly. There are some times where I feel a little bit limited. If demand isn't the right spot because of another factor, it may slow down your progress. Now it's time to add buses to our city. So the first thing we need to do is add a bus depot, which provides the buses, which will then operate on the lines that we create. You are gonna need depot or maintenance facilities for a lot of the mass transit options you're gonna to add to your city. So a familiar cycle begins to develop where you're gonna need some of the same buildings and things to operate each different type of service. None of this should be really that surprising. It's just steps along the way to unlock additional features and transportation options. Setting down your bus stops work pretty much as you'd expect. They alter the road slightly to accommodate the buses being able to pick up passengers. And you can see that you have a decent amount of information on display. And what's cool too is you have two different options for your bus stops. One is sheltered, which is what I'm using throughout this city. I like the fact that you have that option and I like how the sheltered bus stops look. I'm also pleased that a lot of the vehicles in City Skylines 2 look much more realistic. They look much more appropriate. They don't look as cartoony as you'd have in Vanilla Cities 1. Now let's go ahead and get taxis set up so we have some basic transit systems in place. Now, while you don't have to set up specific routes for the taxis, you do have to place a depot to even unlock it, similar to how trains operate. So there's some redundancy there that I think makes it easier to learn certain tools, especially for newer players. So as you can see, our buses immediately begin to start filtering through the city. So we're gonna go ahead and add our taxi depot and get some stops in just to help a little bit with getting folks from one place to another. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about traffic later in the video in terms of what I'm seeing, because I know many of you are wondering if the cities are starting to feel more congestion as they grow. Since we've been talking about signature buildings, I thought this was a good time to segue and talk a little bit more about this signature building, which is a really cool surprise, something that I wasn't really paying a lot of attention to. This is a mixed use signature building. So not only is it cool that it's a mixed use building, so it has like a different purpose than some of the other stuff we've already placed, but it also does different benefits for your city. In this specific example, it also adds to city attractiveness along with well-being. So I see a really big opportunity here for signature buildings as the game progresses through its life cycle. Not only are you gonna get buildings that seem like tourist attractions, but you also get buildings that serve a specific purpose and fit different sort of categories. Sort of like how we have more options with zoning, you have more options in terms of what signature buildings are gonna exist. And I think that's really exciting. Again, there's more stuff packed into the base game of cities too. So when it comes to parks, you have a few different options. Obviously, you're gonna have things like large parks, sports parks, large sports parks, and tourist attractions. So you have a decent variety of things that you can place and utilize in your city. I've used the dog park in a couple areas to fill up some awkward corners. And again, you have some different sized items that you can place wherever. I do think these look pretty nice, though the one drawback I have with them is that the texture that is in place for the grass separates itself from the grass that's already on the map. This might bother some detailers and not being able to customize this right now. Hopefully that's a feature that we can mess with later, or you're just gonna have to find ways of detailing the edges to help it blend into the map better. It may also feel a little bit rigid at times, so I do feel like they're gonna work in like grid systems very, very well. It's gonna be interesting to see how people begin to incorporate these, given how the pathing operates into their cities. So I think it's time we add trains, and this is a little bit of a big project. Obviously I have this area of land up here where we can go ahead and put our train depot and potentially one of our stations. But as you can see, the building is pretty big and this is just the depot. Now, something to keep in mind is while we do have modular buildings where you can add certain functionality or add more capacity, not all of that always takes up the space that is allotted in the initial building you place down. So keep in mind, you may have to have some room for expansion. Now, I may not make the most beautiful train system over here as much as I just wanna show you guys what these buildings look like and how they operate. In the interest of time, I've already done a little bit of terraforming, added a road that I can place the depot on, as well as 
break a piece of the track that was initially on the map so that I can place the depot in between. Much like roads, you do still have a lot of the same information for tracks. And I felt like the tracks were just a little bit more finicky in terms of placement or how they prefer to be placed. And you're going to notice that we have single track, one way tracks and double tracks to place and connect to our train depot. This is going to take pretty much all of them to get our train depot attached properly. I will say the more that I messed with these, the more I felt like they were a little bit more rigid than utilizing roads and cities too. It takes a little bit more polish to get those curves right, especially when you're combining different tracks together. While they feel pretty adaptive to what you're trying to do, you also have these moments of like, please just blend properly and don't have these odd angles at the end of a turn. I can't tell you how many times in Cities 1 that I built all this sort of from scratch, or I tried to at least. I had to get assets from the workshop to make it look the way I wanted, and it's kind of cool to see a building like this incorporated in base game cities too. You have to accommodate this sort of building in your city, and it's big, and it's going to take some time to get to look right, but you have to, to unlock other aspects and things that you need in your city. There's something refreshing with how some of this operates, the overall progression of different aspects of your city and how you need to maneuver through them to get other things. I like that. To be fair, I always prefer a situation or have more buildings than necessary to build out my city. I'm going to hammer home that I am happy to see so many different zoning types as well as realistic looking buildings, not just from a color perspective, but also from a scale perspective. That makes so much more of this usable for someone like me who focuses on realism or creating something that at least appears like it's grounded in reality. Now we're going to go ahead and set up a passenger station and then we'll start working on the cargo station so you can get an idea of what to expect with both. I really want to find a way to incorporate these rails a little bit closer into our downtown, which I think is going to take some time and maybe through the next episode and how we continue to expand the city. If we continue the route that I've gone, we can incorporate them a little bit better because I love some rails running through part of downtown. But just zooming out, you can see how much space something like the train depot takes up and you can already start to get an idea of how much room Cities 2 is going to take up as we continue to expand our city. We have so much room and we're eating it up, but it just feels pretty endless right now. I feel like I have tons of opportunity to expand. Now we're going to run another train line along the highway here, and that's going to lead into our passenger station. We may adjust this a little bit later, like when we get into the next episode in terms of placement, but I just want to get something down so that you guys can see what this looks like. Now with both the depot and the passenger station, you do have options in the modular building category to expand functionality or increase capacity. Now that I've connected our railways and the passenger station to the city roads, we can go ahead and set up our train lines. I don't think train lines are going to operate that different from what you've seen in Cities 1. I'm going to go ahead and set up a train line from the station itself all the way to the entrance point into the city so we can start bringing in folks to the city via train. The devs have talked a lot about vehicles having purpose, right? So you need your depots for the trains to even spawn. So what's interesting about this is as soon as I complete the line, you're going to see a train spawning at the depot, which will then begin to continue its route as a passenger train. Initially, I didn't even think about this being a thing. And now that I've seen it, it's kind of cool. It adds another layer of realism. It's also going to give things like a depot much more purpose. So I can see how as you begin to expand into mass transit, things like depots are going to be significant and keeping up with the demand that they may require. By clicking on the station, you can see plenty of information. You can even charge a parking fee. But one thing that I really liked about this were the upgrades. So not only can you add extra platforms, you can also add a subway interface, making this a transport hub. Plus, you also get a taxi stop and station services, which adds commercial real estate to your train stop, giving you income, but also making that train station more attractive in your city. At a few points, I've said how excited I am for modular buildings. And again, I can see no ceiling to what you're capable of with the modular building functionality in cities too. I mean, you can easily make a passenger train station into a transportation hub and a commercial space just by using modular buildings. So let's go ahead and get a cargo station set up so we can see what that looks like as well. Now, the cargo station functions in a way that actually stores cargo coming into the city or into that station, at least. Then it seems very purposeful that vehicles will actually leave the cargo facility and transport goods throughout your city. What's also significant is that you now have to set cargo train routes. Now, my understanding, based on what I've read about Cities 2 cargo stations, is they are going to operate much like distribution centers. And because of that, companies are going to be relying on these cargo stations to import and export goods. What I'm curious about is if you continue to grow your city and it becomes more necessary to have cargo stations, is how can you use these lines to maybe transport goods more specifically to certain regions of your cities? I guess we'll have to see how that functionality operates, like if it's based on region or anything like that, or if certain companies in certain areas are going to rely more heavily on the train system for those goods or not. 
But regardless, for folks that really like to dive into the simulation side of cities, I think this is a nice added feature, being able to add one more layer of control to how your trains operate. So let's take a look at trams. Trams are going to be another transit option for your cities. And this is something that took me just a minute to figure out how it operates. Instead of placing roads with a predetermined track, you actually upgrade roads to have a track. So your infrastructure can largely exist as you intended it at the very beginning of building your city, and then you can begin to upgrade your roads to accommodate this transit option. You can add double tram tracks or one-way tracks, and you can see that it alters the road to accommodate the track. So out of the depot itself, I added double tracks, and then I created a loop using just single tracks that wraps around the downtown portion of my city as sort of a beltway. After that, you'll go in and you'll add stops, much like you would a bus stop or a taxi stop, and then from there, you can apply the tram line. I do like this system much better than Cities 1 because I'm not cluttered with so many different road options. It cleans that UI up a little bit. Again, it did take me a second to realize what I needed to do initially, but after setting this up, it was pretty simple and straightforward. It gives you the preview of what this is going to look like. And while it is a little bit of a different setup, it does feel familiar. You begin to become accustomed to the systems as they operate in Cities 2. So now we have a few different transit options in our city, and I'm pretty excited to see how these begin to work as our population continues to grow. Many of you have expressed concern over the lack of congestion in different parts of the town, and as you can see, we've hit about the 10k mark in terms of our population. We're not seeing crazy congestion everywhere, but we are seeing pockets of it on certain roads. In some instances, I still see a little bit of a wave of folks moving into the city, which causes a good amount of traffic at the very forefront of adding a bunch of zones. Now, we've talked about Cities 2 being scaled drastically different than Cities 1, and I'm wondering if the population and the way traffic operates is reflected in that change. For example, does it take more of a population in Cities 2 to begin to see some of the congestion you might have saw in Cities 1 at an earlier or lower population level? Now we have our trams operational. They're going to hit the stops we've made along the way and it'd be another option for our sims to travel throughout the city. So I guess we'll continue to see how this develops along with traffic in the area. A little bit earlier, we talked about creating districts in Cities 2 and how that operates a little bit differently. Well, there's also an added functionality for districts and that is basically where you can select certain buildings or certain services to operate within a specific district. So here's a hospital that I've unlocked using development points. And as you can see, it has some modular upgrade options. But on the left panel, you can see the option to select operating district. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a district area over this suburb we've built. Then I'm gonna select the hospital. I'm gonna tell the hospital your operating district is the suburb district that we've just created. As your city grows, you can expect that you're going to need multiple clinics and hospitals. This gives you the opportunity to basically tell Sims which hospital or facility that they're going to use. This is going to add another layer to how services are utilized by your Sims while also controlling the services and how they operate within your city. I think this is another benefit to folks that really enjoy the simulation side of city building. I want to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about my experiences so far at this next stage of city building in Cities 2. In my last video, I talked a lot about the perspective that you might want to have on Cities 2. It is not a continuation of Cities 1. There's a lot of features and familiarity that exist based on our experiences in Cities 1, but Cities 2 is a very different experience entirely. The more I play, the more I continue to see this massive platform that can be built off of for years to come. I've always enjoyed the aesthetic side of building cities. I like to create realistic imagery in my builds, but this is giving me some interest and in actually diving a little bit more into the simulation aspect. And I've been keeping myself a little bit limited in terms of how far I go in the city build. There's some features and things I really haven't touched yet because I still wanna keep it fresh for when I create the next video. Now you guys know I'm excited for modular buildings, but I'm also excited that there's so many different options when it comes to zoning, signature buildings, how they function. There seems to be things that are more specific. You can control them a little bit differently, giving them more value, while also controlling the look of your city at a vanilla level a little bit more distinctly. From a simulation side, I think there's a lot of features there that people are going to be excited about, a little bit more control, or at least the framework to apply more control. So I think whether you're someone that prefers the simulation side or just casual building, I think there's a little bit for both categories. But I'm still really excited that the framework and things that I was excited about in the first episode continue to be things that are exciting in this episode. I can still see the large points of expansion this game can make, and I think that's really important to look at as a platform. I hope that you guys enjoyed the video, and I hope that it broke down many of the things that you've been wondering about or wanting to see a different perspective of. I not only wanted to cover the features that exist as you continue to hit milestones, but also show the development and the growth of a city as organically as I could. So if you have any questions, drop them in the comments down below. I'll answer what I can. Hit the subscribe button so you'll be notified when the next video is going to premiere. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Check the community tab for more information. And thank you for watching. Take care.